Uh, since we 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 have some uh, technical challenges, uh, um, but let's see how far we come. Let's see how far we come. Welcome everyone. Those who have joined us a little bit later. Um, I was set on the wrong platform, and when we tried to switch over, it seems that we had challenges. But this is the time of crisis. Um, I was uh, going to explain crisis in the mind of God. Crisis, the word for crisis that, uh, in the mind of God is kairos, uh, which is an optimum time. And later I'm going to say more about that. Um, as we understand how a day in God um, is created, a day in God starts with evening, night, and morning, the first day. So the first five days of, of, of creation is created by out of the evening, or started with the evening, uh, and then moved into the day. Um, but more about that later. Um, we, we use this platform to blow the trumpet, and I say to you that the trumpet in itself is, uh, uh, is needed for present truth. The trumpet is needed for present truth. And the trumpet is uh, not an, someone with a bugle, an angel with, a, with something in his mouth, but uh, the trumpet is the prophetic voice among the people of God um, that accurately um, decode, describe, communicate um, what is in the heart of God currently. So um, as we blow a trumpet on this platform, we, we aim to, to provide a prophetic apostolic voice uh, that articulates the heart of God, um, or, or what we will we will know as present truth. Um, the posture that I need you to to have uh, as you come to join me in the journey is uh, I appeal to you from the outset um, to be as noble as the Bereans. Now you can go study Acts 17 verse 11. Um, uh, they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So that's the posture that you need to have. Um, you need to receive the word of God with eagerness and then you need to examine the scriptures and it's important posture for you uh, that you must have. Uh, I, 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 I am um, so much uh, uh, keen to say don't believe anyone. Receive the word, but go see for yourself. Go look for yourself. Uh, it is in the day uh, that we need to say um, it is written. And so this is the day that, that we live in. But welcome again. Uh, I need to use again two backdrops as we as we venture into into a, a, a certain broadcast for tonight, but we will continue and maybe see if we can put some uh, more broadcasts in as we as we enjoy the lockdown. Uh, and like I said to you, this is all God's doing. This is all God's doing. Uh, the one backdrop uh, is the hermeneutical key or the key for interpretation. But if you study the Word of God, if you study the, 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 the words of Jesus uh, and the words of Paul, uh, you would come to a conclusion that they have great reference to the Old Testament. Everything Jesus said can be tracked to the Old Testament. When Paul declares he is a prisoner, that idea is, is not a new idea for all. For, for, New Testament, for the New Testament uh, prophet, uh, Isaiah. Uh, the Bible says Isaiah was a Tishbite. And uh, within, within uh, the, uh, the meaning of, of a Tishbite or a Tishbite 
uh, is locked up the, the idea of being a prisoner. Uh, and, and, and we know um, prisoners have no rights. They cannot decide, uh, at, at least in the day of Jesus, I'm not talking about in South Africa today, but in the day of Jesus, uh, the prisoner was simply, uh, and even today, prisoners uh, cannot decide where they want to be, uh, with whom they want to be, uh, and they cannot decide how long they want to be. They might, can make an appeal, but... Um, and so when Paul says that he is a bond servant, a, a, a prisoner of Christ, which we all are, he, he, it's not something that is, that, is, that, that is just new to him. It's something that he borrowed from understanding what the peace by is. But more on that on another day. On another day. The second, uh, to complete the backdrop, is uh, what I always say, if you study Hebrews chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, it will tell you that the law is a puppy and a shadow of the heavenly things to come. So that when you study the law, you'll find most of the con confirmations of the, of the New Testament, also the intent of God, is confirmed in the New Testament, or depend on from where you look. If you look from the Old Testament, it is confirmed in the New Testament. If you look from the New Testament, it is confirmed in the Old Testament. So that is uh, uh, the first backdrop. The second backdrop is... Uh, a study I've done um, on the ascended life. Um, so I spent, uh, I guess it was about 17 weeks that we spent on understanding the ascended life. But in it, uh, it's a key model, a, 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 a architectural design, a, a blueprint for life. And that is the tabernacle um, of Moses, or the tent of Moses. You'll find the outer court, you find the holy place, and you find the most holy place. Now, when you study uh, the temple in the, in, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the meaning, the, the law is a puppy, a shadow, a blueprint, the architectural design um, of the heavenly things to come. So when you study the tabernacle, study Moses' tabernacle, David's tabernacle, David's tabernacle. If you study these, uh, the Temple of Solomon, you find these three dimensions. And it refers to the three dimensions of our lives as we journey with God. Now, sad to say that many people come to the Lord, they journey out of darkness into light, but then they fail to journey further with the Lord. They seem to encamp at the outer court. The outer court is the place where you deal with your sins. Um, sacrifices are made for sin in the outer court, you know that very well. Um, in the holy place, um, which is a picture of Christ, the holy place, uh, a picture of, of, uh, of your Pentecostal experience. Your Pentecostal experience. So, um, in the in the holy place, the experience you experience the gifts of God. You experience God, uh, the things of God. But there, there is a place uh, when the veil of your flesh is torn. There is that place. That place is the most holy place. Now. The outer court. The outer court defined, uh, or in the outer court, uh, one of the features or the characteristics of the outer court is that the outer court is all man. That's why uh, if you find an outer court ministry, you find that all the songs is about man and man's sin and how God has brought them out of sin. And, 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 it's, and, and it's, a, it's a needed experience, it's a needed journey. And then we come into the holy place, you experience Pentecost. Um, your outer court is your Passover experience. 
you experience painted crossing that holy place. But this is the most holy place. We don't have time tonight to to, to decode the holy place and probably I'll share with you on the ascended life on another day. But in the most holy place it's only God. Um, in the holy place it's man and God. And so I believe God is taking us from the most holy place into the, from the holy place into the most holy place. God is shifting us. And this shift is stripping us of everything that we that about God to a place where we come, as we say, a place for God. And so more of that. But um needed to understand the backdrop as we as we're going to, to venture into into the study of the book um, on Psalm Sound the Alarm. Now as a believer you need to know that you are summoned to a heavenly calling. Now your heavenly calling your predestination um, and I don't want to offend you, but people have strange ideas of our predestination. But Paul says we are predestined to be adopted as the sons of God. So the ultimate of maturity is the goal of our Christian life. If they sold any other goal to you, they probably have created something that is not in the mind of God. But the idea that God has is that as you journey with God, your your high calling, and there's many metaphors. It's a place called Mount Zion. It's the upward calling Paul says. It's uh, the place where as you lay hold of it, it lay hold of you. Um, Philippians 3, verse 7 to 11 just furthermore, Paul says, I count everything as lost compared to the possession of the priceless privilege. Uh, and I'm reading the Amplified Translation. The overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This statement, I'm going to read further, but this statement is so loaded with, with new meaning. Because if you have not experienced the revelation of Christ, or the revelation of Christ Jesus, uh, if you've still been operated on the platform of only knowing Jesus, but haven't had the revelation of Christ, then, then, then there will be shortcomings in your understanding. But Paul says, not that I know, want to know Jesus, but I want to know Christ Jesus the Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him. Of perceiving and recognizing and understanding Him more fully and clearly, for his sake I have every I have lost everything and considered it all to mere rubbish, refuse, break, in order that I may win or gain Christ, the anointed one. Now, as you journey with God, you must come to a place where even that which you acquire in God becomes of no value. It is strange how the church of God plays value on a lot of things. I, I love the funerals when uh, people do all the things they want to do and then they say, we come to the most important part. But there's no time for that. Uh, and the preacher have no time because the, the undertaker is working. Uh, wanting to, 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 to leave. And so uh, it, it, is, it is a conflict of notion when um, 
you do everything you want to do and to enjoy everything and then the most important part is left for when there's no time. But this is typical of what the church is doing. This is typical the the nature uh, of the church. And Paul says, um, I've come to a place in my walk that what I've acquired, everything, and, and he gives his whole CV. He says, I consider that nothing. Consider that dumb. And I don't need to confess my own experience. I, I've come to a place where where I have no view on anything. I've come to a place where, where if, if I would have a view on anything, it would have great reference to it is written. I I don't even have, and those who, who know me from from way back would know that I would argue a point. But I've come to that point like Paul has said, whatever I have gained, knowledge, information, status, whatever I have gained, I consider nothing. I consider lost. In fact, he used a very powerful word. He I consider rubbish. Because I want to have this single eye, this single eye for knowing Christ Jesus the Lord. Unless you've, you've come to that point, you cannot journey over into the most holy place. Because I believe that's the place where Paul's flesh was born. And he goes further by saying, and that I may actually be found and known as in him, not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own based on my obedience to the Lord's demand, but possessing that genuine righteousness which comes through faith in Christ. And it's interesting, he says, disobedience comes through faith in Christ. Now, unless the Christ has been revealed to you, Paul says, no, no man after the flesh, not even Jesus. You must shift from the Jesus of Nazareth to the Christ Son of the living God. Because the Jesus of Nazareth was just a vehicle to get God into the earth. For so my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person. Now, our journey, I said, is not to a place. Our, our journey is to a person. Until we all come to the full measure of the full statue of Christ. And to get there, Paul says, I have this determination that I may know him and that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, receiving and recognizing and understanding the wonder of his person, that God was in Christ. More strongly Paul and more clearly, and that I, in the same way, come to know the power, the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, that I may say 
that I continuously transform in spirit into his likeness, even to his death in the hope. That if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. Now, these, these are very deep words, Paul says. Paul says that made over by Christ. Now, the instructions in the um, in the building of the tabernacle was very clear. God said to Moses, Moses, take wood. When you make whatever you make for the for the, for the tent of meeting, but you take the wood and you lay it over with gold. And Paul has this idea that we should be laid over with Christ. And, and, and this knowing, this knowing is not just a, 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 a knowing that comes from his own mind. But this knowing is what the Greek says, epignosis. This knowing from revelation. That you come to a place in your walk in God where, where God is self-revealing God to you. And as God is self-revealing God to you, you are transformed. You are changed into His likeness. Part of the work of Christ is not just to bring the individual. Part of the work of Christ is to bring the corporate people. The ultimate working of Christ's corporate anointing is to bring forth the people for Zion. And that is a people, a finishing people, a people, a corporate entity that will deal with the last enemy for death. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, we shall not all fall asleep. He says, I make, I say with you a mystery, I open unto you a mystery. Though uh, the Old Testament um, authors and writers have glorified the experience in death. Paul comes to an, an, a revelation or understanding that we will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. I don't have time to, to, to decode the, the process of mortality that will put on immortality. But the, the, the the idea is that a corporate entity, when you read, when you carefully read the New Testament, and this is something that the modern church has failed to understand. God is not after the individual, so per se, yes, but God is after corporate people. That's why if you study the word, it is us and we. And maybe I want to 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 um, to highlight that and to close our short uh, introductory session this evening with this thought. We need to shift from the I to the we. It doesn't say for I am chosen. No, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. So the ultimate for God in this season, and I'm way ahead of myself because um, 
we'll see in the next uh, heading what the church is producing is mixture. The church is so much caught up in the outer court where it's all about man. Some, are, some is caught up in the holy place where it is man and God. God wants to take us to a place full of God. God wants to take us to the Feast of Tabernacles. God wants to shift us to the most holy place. Out from which a people will come that will, if you, if you listen to my uh, series on the ascended life, is that we journey from the outer court where God deals with our sin, going to the holy place where we experience Pentecost. And Pentecost is not the way you sing your songs, or the way you, you, you jump and dance before the Lord. Pentecost is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that you will experience in the, in the holy place. But that is not the finality. God wants to, to have you to journey forth with God. Psalm 84, 85 is 4. Blessed is the man whose heart is set on pilgrims. God never intended for us to build a tabernacle at the place of our revelation, at the place of our experience with God. Because what we experience today with God will be out of time, out of date. Tomorrow, because tomorrow God might take us to a new place. And when you are still in the old place, when when the instruction was for the for a people to have a Passover and to prepare for the Exodus out of Egypt, when the Passover was over, if you would have been an Israelite in Egypt, you've been in the wrong place. God took them to the wilderness. In the wilderness, they experienced the, 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 the God in a very new way, in a way that they had not understood God. God made known to them the commandments, the laws uh, that Moses has uh, introduced to them. And, and out of a bunch of slaves, God created a nation. A people set in, in absolute precision. The way they, they were set is the one connected to his spiritual limits. And so, the wilderness was there. When the time was to shift from the wilderness to cross the Jordan, when they crossed the Jordan, if you were still a, a Israelite in, in, this, in the wilderness, God was no longer there. Is it possible that we can be in places in God where, God is, where God's ultimate presence is no longer there? Or that that's, just, that's God's permitted will, God permits it, but that's not God's perfect will. If I can build something in your heart, if tonight I can I can encourage you, if if by the Holy Spirit I can I can I can I can infuse you. I want to infuse you with the spirit of pilgrimage. I want to infuse you with the spirit that that will go to the next place in life. Yesterday's Revelation, yesterday's manner, it's no good for the journey today. We're going to see later, the question would be, as we journey, do we need a map or a compass? But I want to tell you, most of the maps that the churches are using to do church is outdated. And so, Blessed is the man whose heart is set 
confirming. 15 steps from um, Solomon's house to the temple. And if you study the, the, the tabernacle, you'll find 15 steps to move from the outer court into the most holy place. God is shutting us down because he wants our attention and this is um, hope that we can uh, share more on another time. Um, and so, journey with God. Continue to journey. Set your heart on there is more in God than what we are repeating currently. Because Sunday after Sunday, we do the same things over and over. The same cycle. We go around the mountain over and over. And we expect a different result. That is insanity, by the way. But we need to turn it around. Until we come to that place. Paul says, uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 40, this is my closing scripture. Not that I have attained this ideal or am already made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of, to grasp and make my own that for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, had laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own yet. But one thing I do. Now, before I continue to read, Paul says one thing, but he, he, he notes two things. Now, in my mind, I think he wants those two things to be one thing. So, listen to this. It's my own aspiration, the Amplified Translation, forgetting what lies behind and straightening forward to what lies ahead. Now, the old King James is forgetting what is behind and pressing forward. Now, the forgetting what is behind and the pressing forward poses one thing. So you need to do it quickly. You should not spend too much time in the old. Because there are new things, the mysteries that were hidden for ages long. God intended to reveal to us. We have not been on this road before. What God is doing in the earth currently? Isaiah uh, 45, 46 says, I create light and I create calamity. So I believe God is doing what God is doing. At least if you don't believe that, God is getting our attention. God wants to shift us. God wants to take us into a new day. Life will not be the same after Corona. This crisis has become God's kairos. And so you and I, as I have our loins girt, our sandals on our feet, and our rod in our staff in our hand, ready to make a journey. May God bless you. Hope you've enjoyed tonight. And we'll see each other again.